Welcome. It's really nice to have you uh, joining me uh, this afternoon uh, for noontime prayer and the reading of the Psalms. Uh, so let's just begin with prayer today. Father, Father, I just thought thank you for this day. I thank you for the gift of life today that we get to live, that we get to breathe, and I thank you for beating hearts, and I thank you for those of us who have a measure of health, Lord. Uh, I thank you for your presence, which is always with us. I thank you that you promise us, us that you will be with us even to the end of the age. I thank you that you promise us in Hebrews 13, 5, that by no means, no, never will you ever leave us nor forsake us. I thank you that you abide with, with us. I thank you that you have made us the holy of holies, that we have become the very temple of the living God who has chosen to make his presence known on this earth through us. We give you praise for your salvation, Lord for the deliverance in our own lives from levels of darkness only that we ourselves know. Thank you for the salvation that you've, you've wrought, Lord, for the gift of eternal life, for the hope of heaven, for the hope of a day that, that is coming where there will be no more tears, no more pain, no more death, no more grief, no more goodbyes, Lord. And Father, now I turn my attention to the world and to uh, what's going on around, uh, around us, all around the world, Lord. First of all, I pray for all those families who have lost loved ones, Lord, and who have loved ones now in hospitals, on ventilators, and in ICUs, Lord. This has to be an extremely crushing time for them. A time where lives that were, seem to be completely secure are now anything but secure. The future in doubt. So Father, I pray for comfort for those, each one of those family members, even as they may be surrounding the bed or I don't even know if they allow them to go in, Lord. But I pray for comfort for them. I pray that you would shine the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ into their hearts if they don't know you, Lord, that they may know your compassionate and comforting embrace. They might know that understand, understanding surpassing peace that only you give. And I pray for all those people lying in ICUs and even in tent hospitals on, and on government hospital ships. And I don't know if they're open yet, but they're coming, Lord. I just pray that the loss of life would be minimal, Lord. Show us mercy, show us grace. I know we don't deserve it, Lord. We have turned each to our own way. As a world, we have chased after every sin that you've told us not to get into, not because you're a curmudgeon, Lord, because you dearly love us and warn us that there's consequences to the things we open up, Pandora's boxes, Forgive us, Lord. Forgive us as a church for being forgiving an anemic gospel. Forgive us as a church for thinking that we are strong when we are weak. And Father, I pray that you would forgive our nations and our world for turning their backs on you in so many ways, Lord. In our society, we've kicked you just about out of everything. And yet your love for us never ceases. Your love for us knows no bounds. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. You so loved the world that you gave your only son. I thank you for your love, which is unswerving. I thank you that your love is unconditional. You loved us even when we were in the midst of all of our junk. 
but salvation is conditioned on our coming to believe. And so we pray, Lord, that in this time all around the world, that you would be speaking into people's spirits and into their the depth of their hearts, and that you might be shining that light into uh, their minds, Lord, that they might come to know and understand who you are, that you are loving and gracious and kind, and yet by no means leaving the guilty unpunished, that you punish the guilty for all time in the body of your Son. Father, we pray for, again, our leaders around the world and in our nation. Um, it appears that in our nation they've come up with a stimulus package. I don't know what to think about that, Lord, but I, I pray that you would bring us through this time, maybe to a brand new world and a brand new era in our lives, maybe an era of hardship and an era of of pulling up our um, belts, tightening our belts. None of us can foresee the future, Lord, but you, you know what's coming. And so we entrust these coming days and months and years into your hands. And as I look at the world circling around here, Lord, maybe it's sort of like the view you have, seeing the world from a distance, seeing India passing by, seeing Saudi Arabia and Iran and Iraq and Israel, seeing Italy and Germany and Spain and France and England and Africa as well, Lord. Seeing South America and Central America and United States lit up with so much of our wealth, Lord. Mexico and Canada, Lord. There's Hawaii zipping by. Japan. China and the Koreas and Indonesia and Vietnam and Cambodia and so many other countries, Lord. Father, I know that um, there are people who are receiving uh, racist comments and slurs and um, I pray that you would put a stop to that. This is not about ethnicity or race. This is not about where it started or who started it. We all have a share in its uh, transmission and its progression. We haven't taken it seriously, Lord. And for that, forgive us too. Give us loving hearts for everyone as Christians around us. Help us to, to watch our tongues. Help us, help us to watch what we post. Not to post things in self-righteousness or condemnation, but to post things that point people to the love of God, to his mercy to his grace, to his, again, clarion call that is calling out. Come to me, all who are weary and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Father, we need rest. We need deliverance. We need your healing touch. We need the one who called out to the storm, peace be still. Father, you, we pray that you would call out to this storm, peace be still. Peace be still. Peace be still. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, again, it's uh, very nice to have you here with us today. Uh, we're going to be looking at Psalm uh, 2, and it's a psalm of judgment. It's You can't look at it in any other way. It's a royal psalm. It's the first royal psalm, which means it's a psalm 
uh, predicting the coming king uh, that, that will fulfill the line of the, the Davidic covenant. Uh, it's, a, it's a psalm that speaks of the coming Messiah very, very directly, uh, speaking of the Son and the Father. Uh, and so let's read it. Um, I'm going to be reading from uh, the New American Standard Bible, and I pray that you can read along on the screen. Why are the nations in an uproar? And the peoples devising a vain thing. The kings of the earth take their stand, and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let us tear their fetters apart and cast away their cords from us. Then God's response, He who sits in the heaven laughs. The Lord scoffs at them. Then he will speak to them in his anger and terrify them in his fury, saying, But as for me, I have installed my king upon Zion, my holy mountain. I will surely tell of the decree of the Lord. He said to me, You are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me and I will give you the nations as your inheritance and the very ends of the earth as your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron. You shall shatter them like earthenware. Now therefore, O kings, show discernment. Take warning, O judges of the earth. Worship the Lord with reverence and rejoice with trembling. Do homage to the Son, that he not become angry and you perish in the way. For his wrath soon may be kindled. How blessed are all who take refuge in him. Those are incredibly powerful words. Um, going back to Psalm, um, the first verses there, um, there's a context to this psalm. And uh, it, it arises out of the Davidic covenant. And so um, there's a context that speaks of the past. This is something that has already happened, This, this, uh, the nations in an uproar and so on. It's something that is yet to happen in the end of time, uh, as far as we know. And it is something that is a warning to us today, to kings and peoples and nations. Uh, and so take, let's take a look at first the Davidic covenant. I'm going to read it to you. It's found in um, 2 Samuel verses, or 2 Samuel chapter 7, verses 8 through 16. I'm not going to be reading all of those verses, but if you want to read it at home, uh, just to do some further uh, reading uh, about this psalm and, and uh, meditate on it, it's 2 Samuel chapter 7, verses 8 through 16. So this is speaking of uh, David's house. He shall build a house for my name. And I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be a father to him, and he will be a son to me. This is speaking of a coming king that's going to fulfill the Davidic dynasty. When he commits iniquity, I will correct him with the rod of iron. And I'm thinking, well, wait a minute. Jesus isn't going to commit iniquity, any iniquity. He, he, we know that he was without sin. He who knew no sin became sin for us. So I think what this is getting at, when he commits iniquity, he doesn't. But when he takes on our iniquity on himself, I will correct him with a rod of men, which he's, which happens when he's beat uh, by, I think it's um, the pilots, uh, the Roman cohort by the soldiers who beat him with a rod, and the strokes of the sons of men when they give him the, uh, the scourging with the cat of nine tails. Um, and so we're still speaking of the Messiah here. And my loving kindness, that covenant love, that hesed love, where God uh, and Jesus covenanted together and saying, even up to death, even into death, we will uh, keep this covenant in, in love. That loving kindness. My loving kindness shall not depart from him. The Lord also declares to you that the Lord... Oh, I, I went to the wrong one. I'm sorry, I got these twisted around. I started at the wrong place. So let me start here. The Lord also declares to you that the Lord will make a house for you when your days are complete and you lie down with your fathers. I will raise up your up your descendant after you who will come forth 
from you and I will establish his kingdom. So there you have the beginning of it. I was thinking, what's wrong here? Um, this is speaking of the Messiah, the text we just saw. I won't read it again. He, will, he shall build a house for my name. And then the third one, as I took it away from Saul, whom I removed from before you, your house and your kingdom shall endure for me forever. Your throne shall be established forever. So this has to be talking about Jesus, the Messiah, the coming king. So that's the backdrop, that Davidic covenant is what they call that, the, that promise to David that a descendant of his will uh, have an eternal throne, if you will. So now we return to our Psalm 2, and we begin with, Why are the nations in an uproar and the people devising a vain thing? The kings of the earth take their stand and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, let us tear their fetters apart and cast away their cords from us. So I said there's uh, three different fulfillments or applications of this. One was in the past. If you go to um, Acts chapter 4, I'm not going to read the whole thing. You'd have to read from uh, Acts chapter 3, verse 1 through uh, chapter 4, verse 31. Again, that's chapter 3, verse 1 through chapter 4 of Acts, verse 31. Uh, if you want to read this whole story in context, but uh, Peter has healed a man uh, who's around 40 years old, more than 40 years old. He's healed him, and as a result, he's he and his uh, uh, fellows with him are dr drugged before the Sanhedrin, and uh, he gives them the Sanhedrin, his second sermon. And then during that uh, passage, he says uh, these words. When they had been released, they released uh, Peter after it. Um, they went to their own companions and reported all that the chief priests and the elders had said to them. And when they heard this, they lifted their voices to God with one accord and said, O Lord, it is you who made uh, the heaven and the earth and the sea and all that is in them, who by the Holy Spirit through the mouth of our father David, your servant, said, Why did the Gentiles rage and the peoples devise futile things? And the kings of earth took their stand, and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. So there, uh, Peter is, is uh, referencing that passage back in Psalm 2. And then he says this, For truly in this city there were gathered together against your holy servant, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius, the kings of the earth, right, the rulers, both Herod and Pontius, along with the Gentiles and the people of Israel. Why are the nations in uproar? The nations, meaning the Gentiles and the peoples divide, devising a vain thing, speaking of uh, the peoples, both Gentile and Hebrew alike. And then the kings, Pilate and Herod, taking their stand and the rulers uh, taking their counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed. So it's against God the Father and against his anointed Jesus saying, let us tear their fetters apart and cast away their cords from us. How did they do it? By putting Jesus to death. They thought if they could do that, uh, inspired by the real enemy behind things, Satan and his cohorts, um, they thought they could be free of, of God's rule in their life. Look what it, the response to it. He who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord scoffs at them. Then he will speak to them in his anger and terrify them in his fury, saying, But as for me, I have installed my king upon Zion, upon my holy mountain. I have installed my king upon Zion. If you go back to the story of Abraham and the giving up of the, uh, of, or the sacrifice of Isaac, which never happened, but it almost happened, that was on Mount Moriah. That's Mount Zion. That's where uh, Jerusalem was built upon, Mount Moriah. Mount, uh, upon Zion is uh, another name for Mount Moriah where Jerusalem is built. So he says, I've installed my king. How does God the Father install Jesus as king? Do you remember the placard above the cross, what it said? It said, uh, uh, King of the Jews, right? Jesus Christ, King of the Jews. And so, um, get this, Jesus was installed as king when he gave up his life for the world. That was putting him on the cross and killing him. I look at that world spinning around and for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, his only son, that whosoever should believeth in him should not perish but have eternal life or everlasting life. I have installed my king upon Zion, my holy mountain. And so his, his wrath, his anger, it says that it's going to be taken out on this people, and yet in the kindness and love of God, he takes it out in the body of his own son. 
This is incredible grace, incredible love for us. Um, we go on to Psalm, uh, the, the, the next section, I will surely tell of the degree of the Lord. He said to me, you are my son, today I have begotten you. Not, we know that Jesus lived, lived eternally uh, with, with God the Father, but this is in a sense uh, that royal inauguration uh, of the cross. You are my son, today I have begotten you. Ask of me and I will surely give the nations as your inheritance and the very ends of the earth as your possessions. Meaning that Jesus now is, is absolute ruler. Uh, all authority has been given to him in heaven, on, in heaven and on earth. I am reminded of, of Philippians chapter 2, I think it's 9 through 11, where it says, every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord. And then the next section, you shall break them with a rod of iron. You shall shatter them like earthenware. Now, therefore, O king, show discernment. Take warning, O judges of the earth. Worship the Lord with reverence and rejoice with trembling. There is a day coming when there will be a judgment of judgment, when this world will be destroyed with fire, so much so that the elements will, will melt with heat. Uh, and upon that destruction then comes the great white throne judgment, where everyone uh, who has not received Christ will be judged. Um, and I, I don't think it's so much for their sin, it's for rejecting Christ. Then they're left in their sin. It says, now therefore, O king, show discernment, take warning, O judges of the earth. This is something we can pray for, for our kings, for our presidents, for our leaders. We can pray for President Trump. I know a lot of people hate President Trump. A lot of people hated President Obama. I think of a completely different view. I remember that God so loved President Obama, God so loved President Trump, that he gave his only son for both of them and for their families. For God so loved Nancy Pelosi, for God so loved uh, uh, Mitch McConnell. We need as a church to quit hating our po politicians and start getting on our knees and praying for them. Praying for them fervently that God might turn their hearts towards him that if they don't know him, that they would come to know him. If they do know him, that they would uh, get in lockstep with his spirit, walking in the spirit. Uh, it, it, we can pray that they would come to worship the Lord with reverence. That includes our governors, our city officials, uh, and rejoice with trembling. And so this has that, that future application to the coming judgment when the king will be revealed. It says he will touch down on the Mount of Olives. Um, it's also calling us to worship the Lord with reverence. Worship Yahweh with reverence in the mystery of the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And we rejoice with trembling uh, that he has come to save us. And in the last verse, do homage to the king. Literally, it's kiss the king. Uh, in that day, when you came in to see a king, you would bow down and uh, kiss the ring on his, uh, on his finger. Uh, the meaning of it, that it's an idiom, uh, the meaning of it is to do homage to the Son. It can also mean to lay hold of instruction. So lay hold of the instruction coming from the Son, that he not become angry and you perish in the way. We don't think of Jesus as an angry person, as one who gets angry, but we know that he does. He got angry in the temple twice when he overturned the, the, the tables of the of the money changers and of the people selling uh, the, the turtle doves and, and the sheep and so on in the court of the Gentiles. For his wrath may soon be kindled. Um, I don't think that this is God's judgment. I, I have no way of knowing. I'm, I'm not God. Uh, last Sunday I said that I think this is his love being manifested. And I'm not saying that he caused this. Uh, please don't hear that. I think human uh, error, human greed, all across the board has ca caused this. We waited too long. We've um, not really uh, understood how severe this could be. So, but I said that this is God's love for us. I think uh, that in the midst of us, he, he is allowing it. And because he's allowing it, I have to ask, why, why could he be allowing this, this pandemic? And my only thought is he still loves that world um, spinning around. And it's not the planet itself. It's a world populated with the people that he knit together while uh, they were yet in, in their mother's womb. Every person on the planet, we're told, uh, Jesus, the one through whom all things were created, he knit us together while we were yet in our mother's womb. He knows us intimately. He loves us dearly. 
And if you hear his voice today, know that he loves you and he's calling you home. He's calling you to believe, to entrust your life into his hands, to believe what the Father has said of him, this is my son, to believe what he, who he is, that he is the son of God. He is deity in the flesh, that he is the one who will sit on the throne forever, that in the mystery of the Trinity, it's Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and that he is the Messiah, the one who came and took all of that sin in his own body. He who knew no sin became sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God. And then get this last line. So far, it's all kind of bad news. Uh, even the Lord laughing at the nations. How blessed are all who take refuge in him. You want a blessing today? Take refuge in the sun. Get into the ark that is the sun in his resurrection, in his crucifixion, crucifixion and resurrection, in what he did for you on the cross having taken all of the punishment that was due to you, he took it upon himself and gave up his life that you might have eternal life. How blessed are all who take refuge in him. Are you somebody who's already uh, believed and come into the kingdom and, and been born of the Spirit? You're born of the Spirit the moment you believe, according to the Gospel of John. You're given eternal life the moment you believe, according to John 5.24. If that's the case, how blessed are you who have taken refuge in him? So there's two directions with this, this psalm. To those who are unbelieving, to those who have rejected the king, who, who have rejected the Messiah. Be careful, folks. This is a dire warning. Do homage to the son. Kiss his ring. Get instruction from him that he not become angry and you perish in the way. For his wrath may soon be kindled. There's a day of judgment coming. It's called the day of wrath or the day of... The, the last day, the day of judgment, it's coming. I don't know when it's coming, but don't waste your time. Take refuge in Jesus. Call out to him. Save me, Jesus. Call out to him. Remember me when you come into your kingdom. Know that you are incapable of doing anything in your life because we have become so corrupt in ourselves. But know that he has done everything you need from birth until death, from birth until your introduction into heaven. He has taken care of every one of our needs. He is in control. The king still sits on his throne. The king laughs even in the midst of this, not laughing in the sense of derision uh, towards us, but meaning that he's still in control when we doubt him, when we doubt what he's doing. He loves us, folks. He loves us more than we can know. I pray that you would know his love today. So I want to just close with uh, one last prayer from, from uh, Ephesians. Uh, and I'm going to go over and actually get the, the prayer. Nancy, actually, can you get it to me? It's sitting right there, please. Uh, it's on the edge of the table there. This just came to me. So we're going to close with this prayer. Thank you. Let's pray. Father, for this reason I bow my knees before you, from whom every family in heaven on earth derives its name, that you would grant to us, everyone listening today, and to our churches, according to the riches of your glory, to be strengthened with power through your Spirit in their inner being, so that Christ may dwell in our hearts through faith, and that we, being rooted and grounded in love, and I'm sure that that's the, the love that we see in the face of Christ on the cross, that we may be, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ which surpasses knowledge, that we may be filled up to the fullness of God. Now to you, you who is able to do exceedingly abundantly beyond all that we ask or think, according to the power that works within us, to you be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. I encourage you to uh, reread this psalm several times through and then go over to 1 Samuel. Uh, again, 1 Samuel, or 2 Samuel, excuse me, 2 Samuel chapter 7, verses 8 through 16. And then again, Acts chapter 3, verse 1 through Acts chapter 4, verse 31, if you want to do some extra uh, reading on this, 
But um, let this sink in. How blessed are you who have taken refuge in Jesus. Thanks for coming today, uh, for joining me. And again, we'll be back tomorrow at 1155 so you can get connected. And we'll be looking at Psalm 3. Uh, bless you in your day.